Welcome everybody. It's good to have you here. And man, I think I thank everybody for coming. I know there's a few that couldn't make it, so we're going to record this for those guys. But uh, Jennifer, right here next to Mark, there you go. I appreciate y'all coming tonight. You should have received uh, one copy of each of these. And if and if anybody's just dying and desperate, <laughs> Albany's like, I don't never saw that book before in my life. Uh, if you're dying and I've got some extras in my office, okay? So um, you've got some catch-up work to do. Um, but if you're dying and desperate to have a second copy of probably the workbook, um, I have some extra copies in my office which I can provide to you tonight. And the goal was is that you were supposed to work through lesson one and two before you came here tonight. Now, I'm just going to be real honest with you and tell you that, that the real work of this is, is the, the stuff that you do outside of this room, right, is the stuff that you do when you're working through the material. We're just gathered here basically to recap, discuss, and hold each other accountable to do the material, <laughs> right? Um, and so that's what that's what this is all about. Um, the history of this is that uh, um, I've been I've known about Matthias Media for a long time. Greg Fustel uh, has a friend that works at Matthias Media. Uh, he is stationed in Youngstown. That's right, Youngstown. And um, we were looking. I was looking for uh, what what material can we use as a small group leader training because. Here's what happens. Somebody comes along and they say, I want to be a small group leader. What's the process? I want to start a life group. What's the process to do that? And I would go like this. Duh, I don't know. You know, have you been part of a life group? How's that going? You know, what do you, you know? So I'd sit down and talk to with them and maybe we'd go through some stuff. But this <clears throat> I thought would be, uh, Greg and I thought would be a good um, basic training for life group. So we went through it. it Greg and I and Tyler Lilly went through it uh, earlier this year. And we would meet at Panera and go through the lessons and all this kind of stuff. And we, we came to the conclusion we thought it was a good small group train, a small group leader training material. And so then we thought, well, let's just get everybody trained. And then when new people come on, we will, we will do that. Now, I'm going to shut up and pray, and then we'll look at some stuff. Father, we thank you for this beautiful night. And I thank you for these folks that have come out tonight to be part of this uh, discussion. Uh, Father, I pray that you would bless our time uh, that you would use life groups in the in the ebb and flow, the life of this church, as people come in, that perhaps they can get connected to a life group. Uh, they can then uh, be shepherded, as the book says, to the right towards Christ. Wherever they start, Father, that they might uh, be transformed or transferred and then transformed into the image of your son, Jesus Christ. Father, uh, we need help with this process. Uh, these are, um, each person is different. They have different needs. Uh, they are coming from a different background. Some churched, some unchurched, some churched in very, uh, let's call them heterodoxical churches, <laughs> confused uh, beliefs that don't make any sense. Uh, some are coming from good, solid, Bible-believing churches and still are at a place in life where they need to grow and change. And so, Father, help us as leaders to recognize where everyone's at, where we're at in the journey to towards maturity and Christ-likeness. And, Father, may we um, help others uh, move to the right, move to Christ, and grow and change. And we pray that you would help this to be a tool to allow us to do that. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so again, um, uh, this is the material. Now, did, did, did everybody get a chance to do lesson one and two? Okay, so I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time uh, rehashing that. We'll, we'll hit some high spots. So let's, we'll, let's just talk about lesson one really quick. Lesson one was understanding small groups. And um, they put up, they had this diagram in the video. Everybody, was everybody able to access the videos that, that install the instructions in the front? Okay, good. That's great. Um, did you like my password? <laughs> did anybody try to get into my account? And I'm surprised, honestly, with some of you in this group that you didn't get in there and try to change my profile picture, at least, you know. Well, now, now that you have that idea, um, don't do that. So anyway, they had this diagram in the, they had this diagram in the uh, videos, right? And, and it's the diagram of an arrow moving to the right. And, uh, they had on one side of the arrow, and this is all from Colossians 1, right? The domain of darkness, and on the other side, the kingdom of the sun, right? And we, we talked in the video about 
helping someone move to the right. And for some people in your group, that's going to look like they need to be saved, right? They're unsaved people and they need to be transferred from the kingdom, uh, domain of darkness into the kingdom of the sun. I got to tell you, right now I am in the midst of an exciting uh, counsel. I've, I've got several counseling cases going on and one of the couples that I'm counseling are not believers, but they're seeking. It is so energizing to be around young people who are unbelievers, who are desperately seeking the Lord. They're asking good questions. They're asking questions that stretch my understanding, right? Because they're coming from a place of being unchurched. And so they're like trying to figure all this stuff out, right? And um, one of the most exciting things about that is uh, uh, this is a very odd couple because they really, really like each other, but they're terrible at being married to each other. Is that weird? It's like we're best friends, but we fight all the time. It's odd. So, so uh, anyway, I, here's, here's the part that's really fun. You know, they're over here and they're having a ter terrible time in their marriage. And so I taught them Ephesians 4, the four rules of communication. Be honest, keep current, attack the problem, not the person, act, don't react. Took a whole night for like two hours we went over this. And the next week they're like, this is amazing. Like, we, we put this into practice. Like, I've never asked for forgiveness so many times in one week in my life. But it's working. And I'm like, and then I'm like, uh, what questions do you have about Christ? You know, I mean, when are you, you know, I'm trying to get them to trust Jesus as their Savior. I think they're getting close. Uh, we, had a, we had a nice call last night, and, and they're applying what they're learning. They're like sponges, right, just soaking it up. And what brought them to that was we're just, we're in dire straits. Like, we're, we were considering divorce, right? We were, you know. And then once they are... Uh, once they are uh, brought into the kingdom of the sun, sin remains, right? And so we're trying to, all of it, this, this is kind of where we're at. We're on this side of the dial, uh, this side of the cross, and we're trying to grow and change and become more like Jesus Christ. And then they went on and talked about the, kind of a, a spectrum, right? All the way from far away to thinking about it, to hearing the gospel, to being a new creation, to growing in Christ, and then finally where we all want to be where many of you are right to you're at mature service that doesn't mean you're perfect yet none of us are but that's where you're at now for how many of you for how many of you so this is all under the heading of like the purpose for life groups right so how many of you have ever thought about your life group kind of like this like this is where people come to to move towards Christ, whether they're unbelievers or whether they're believers. Has anybody ever thought about your life group like that? I, Steve has. Yeah, Steve. Okay. Some of you are nodding yes. Wendy's nodding yes. Uh, how has this changed? Uh, how has this kind of, I guess I'll ask it this way. Has this brought any focus to your thinking about your life group? Because I know it did for me when I went through it the first time. I'm like, oh, th yes, this is what I should be doing. I should be helping every single to the degree that I can, I should be ministering to people in my life group and helping them move to the next, the next stage to the right. Well, this way. I'm going like this, but it's like this, right? Does that make sense? All right. Any, any feedback on this diagram or anything that stood out to you before I move on? Wow. This is going to be like teaching Sunday school. I can tell. Where's Dan Miner when we need him? Okay. So... <clears throat> Then they moved on and they talked about the how, right? Again, from Colossians 1, they talked about the how and they talked about the four Ps. I don't know if you remember this. I thought the, the workbook kind of let us down because it would have been nice for them to have the four Ps like, and then you just fill in the blanks. But I had to just find a blank spot in my book and document those in there. But anyway, uh, the first P is proclamation. What's that talking about? Proclaiming, yeah, well, the Word of God, right? Uh, including the Gospel. It's the proclamation, right? Proclamation. Uh, I don't know, has this last year taught us, has this last year not taught us we, that we have to really pick carefully to what truths we cling? And what are, you know, if you think about biblical truth, uh, it never lets you down, right? It's, it's, it's always dependable, always reliable, never lets you down. And so we proclaim the Word of God. That's the truth, right? That's what we're, that's what we're going for. I think I just hit the computer. And then prayer, right? That's one of the four P's is prayer. And uh, at, what you're going to find, each, each, each of the three training sessions that we get together, I'm going to highlight one or two 
of the appendices in the back of this workbook. The appendices in the back of this workbook are gold, absolute gold. And we're not going to go through them formally here, but I'm just going to highlight a couple each night, one or two each night. Um, but there's a, the, the appendix on prayer. Read it, read it again, read it 10 times, uh, apply it in your life group. It's gold. All right, uh, people, right? People, uh, we're, uh, we're working, we're doing our work in the lives of people, right? And then perseverance, meaning God, God oftentimes does not, uh, I'm going to use Matt Hintz as an example. When Matt Hintz came to Christ, God did not instantly sanctify you, right? <laughs> okay, maybe, maybe we should look at Marv. Marv, because you've told me that that wasn't true. Okay, okay. So for most people, uh, God did not instantly sanctify us. I'm still in the process of sanctification. You're still in the process of sanctification. And so um, we, we, we patiently work with people. We persevere with people. Uh, people go through hard times. People go through seasons of their life. I'm finding out uh, by firsthand experience that um, I thought when my kids were pooping in their pants, that was the tough part of parenting. I could not have been more wrong. Could not have been more. I would love to change poopy diapers tonight when I got home. I would cherish it. I would go, mmm, heaven. But I'm learning that parenting adult children, that's way harder, right? It's, it's, and, and so I'm, and what God's doing in that, in my life, is he's changing me, right? He's, he's forcing me through these trials to rely on him, to put my hope in his word, what he has to say. Does that all make sense? And so uh, God works in different stages and different people. Now, this, this never came out in the lesson that I know of, but uh, I want to ask a question. Well, see, I, I know what the answer is in my brain that I'm looking for, but I know that I can't ask the question in such a way to get it. But I just want to make an observation. One of the coolest things about this, let me ask you, do you need a building to accomplish this? You don't. Do you need a computer to accomplish this? You don't. Do you need lots of money to accomplish this? You don't. God in his sovereign plan has given us, if, if we have ourselves and we're in community and we have the word of God, we can do this, right? You can do this in your house. You can do it in a park. You can, you can, God's given us uh, some tools to use in helping ourselves and others grow and change uh, that are not dependent on high dollar technology, fancy facilities, lots and lots of cash, right? We don't need any of that stuff. If we have the word of God, our brains that God gave us, and, and we're operating with other people in community, we can do this. Now, um, there's one other observation that I, that I want to make. And I think this did come out in the book. At least I know it came out in The Thing Is. What is the benefit to us, or is there a benefit to us, from leading a small group and helping people move to the right? What it, and what, what is that benefit, if there is a benefit? We move with them. Okay. Well, we move as we, uh, for some reason that I can't fully explain, but it's, I've experienced it all my life, well, I can explain it because it's, it's in the Word of God, but um, we, we grow as we help others grow, right? As, uh, I can't tell you how many conversations, I, I remember vividly, especially back in Indiana, smaller community, I understand, but back in Indiana, I had the following conversation with several men especially. They said, Pastor, you know, when I first got to this church, I was learning so much. The, the, the Word of God was being preached, and I wasn't the preacher, so I can't take any credit. Um, but the Word of God was being preached, and I was growing, and, and I was applying these things, and it was awesome. And I'm like 10 years in now, and I come to church on Sunday, and I just don't get as much out of the messages that I used to. What was his problem? He, he didn't... After he got so far to the right, he didn't turn around 
and say, there's people back there that I could bring to where I'm at. He never did that. And so uh, not knowing, uh, not ever studying the small group in the vine, I, that was the advice that I gave him. I said, you've been being pulled along by the pastor of this church for so many years, it's time for you to turn around and bring someone with you. And he, and he to his credit, well, several of the guys, to their credit, they started. They, they started a small group. They started a men's Bible study. They did something to invest in the lives of others. And lo and behold, they came back and said, we started grow, I've started growing again. This is wonderful because mostly it's, it's the whole, now that I have to teach the material, uh, I, I, uh, it's forcing me to understand it in a deeper way. Okay, thoughts on this? Okay, I'm going to get, I'm going to get, uh, I'm going to ask some questions that are going to be really hard, so pay attention. Why are you a Christian? Anyone can answer that. Because God chose me. Okay, okay. You had nothing to do with it. Right. Okay, Lane Shirley is in the, is in the class. <laughs> You never, you never said yes to God. God's sovereignty and man's responsibility, but I, I hear what you're saying, and uh, I, I, uh, you know me. I'm a God's God's sovereignty, man's responsibility, working together to yeah to to do His thing in ways that I don't fully understand. All I know is that if God doesn't work, I'm a dead man, right? Yeah. Why are you a Christian? Okay. Anyone else? Why are you a Christian? When somebody in your small group asks you, well, why, did, why, did, why are you a follower of Jesus Christ? What are you going to tell them? Do you have a good answer for that? Right? Is that something that you can share in a way that makes sense to them, in a way that it reaches into their heart, in a way that challenges them to grow? I mean, I'm just I'm throwing things out here, out here. So let me ask you, let's, let's ask a different question. Why do we try not to sin? Our sins are forgiven. Why try? What's the big deal? If I'm going to heaven when I die and that's a done deal, then why? Okay, I agree with that to a certain extent. There's, there's more to it. Gratitude. The love of Christ constrains you. Yes. Yes, gratitude for what Christ has done for us. Absolutely, I agree with that. Obedience. What else? We're called to be holy. Okay. Is there any reason for that? Is there a reason why we're called to be holy? Well, we're doing what if we, if we choose not to sin, we are doing what God created us for. And so really we're living as God intended us to live, which ultimately, I mean, it's not self-serving. But in a sense, it is self-serving because it is going to be what's best for me if I live the way that God wants me to live. Okay. I agree with everything that's been said so far. I'm just challenging you to think these things through. Go ahead, Steve. I want to hear more. Stay in communion with Okay. Uh, t- today, in my premarital counseling, I was explaining to a couple who had never heard this concept before about biblical forgiveness. And... The, the judicial part and the relational part, and uh, we want to stay in good relations with God, and that means confessing our sin. That means trying to walk in righteousness, right? To live in righteousness, um, and to not, and that keeps us in good relation with God. We know our sins are forgiven. The the judgment, you know, we're done with that. But why else? What other possible reasons do we choose to not sin? Witness. Exactly. Exactly. If, we, if we're different, that's going to cause people to at least say, what's going on here, right? What's, what's different about your life, right? You're missing a big one. To glorify God and which is related to that. Okay, that's, that's, that is a big one. But, uh, well, you're, the Holy Spirit's in you. You shouldn't want to. It should feel wrong. Okay, God, good, good. Convicted in your spirit. Yeah. Okay, being, God designed the universe, and there are consequences to sin, and being forgiven of your sin does not absolve you of the consequences of your foolish actions, right? Um, the th- what's that? To not sear your conscience, very good. We have a new nature. We have a new nature. Oh, man, see? 
you, you get us all together and we can figure this out. Yeah. The big thing that I always think about, that's very good. The big thing that I always think about is sin was killing us. Like it, it was our death sentence. You know, left, to our, left in our sin, we're in hell forever. And here comes somebody along and releases us from our sin. Why on earth would we want to continue to walk in that which was killing us? We've been freed from that, right? So why not, you know, and then there's all the other benefits of being a witness and being uh, walking in gratitude and stuff. Now, the only reason I bring any of this stuff up is that, is that these are the types of things that um, I'm challenging us all to think through because there's going to be people in our life groups, right, that are going to have questions like that, right, like some basic fundamental questions. And there's other people that are going to come and say, can you explain in two sentences predestination and election and uh, election and whatever the opposite of election is, I forget. But, uh, um, and I'll say, no, go away. Uh, here's a book to read. Okay, um, anything, else on, anything else on this before we move on to chapter two or anything else that stuck out to you in chapter one? I know these chapters take a while to get through. These lessons take a while to get through, but, but I found them to be helpful. The purpose of our life groups is to help people move towards Christ. That's the big, the big takeaway from chapter 1. The purpose of our life groups is to help people move towards Christ. Okay, so before we move on to chapter 2, uh, would anybody like to share a testimony or, or um, um, some ways that you had some effectiveness in helping do that. Or maybe this is all new and we, and we haven't been focused on this yet. Anyone, anyone? Okay, well, this is what we want to focus on, right? Is helping people move to the right towards Christ likeness. Okay, the second lesson that we, the second lesson that we went through was understanding your role as leader. Now, uh, if you watched the video, didn't you think it was cute? Um, all the different leaders were given a little testimony about this. This is what I think my role is. And they were like all over the roadmap. Like one person's like, I think I should lecture for an hour. And one person's like, I just let it go wherever it wants. And, you know, wherever the group discussion goes, that's kind of where we end up and stuff. And, and uh, obviously they were doing that to make their point, right? You, we have to have, have some sort of uh, focus here, okay? So uh, your role as life group leader. Now, I don't know if you picked up on this. I, I think that you probably did. But if you take the four P's that we did in session one, they just kind of like applied those in session two. And then they're going to unpack that even more in the following three sessions, right? Um, yeah, so lead the people to the Word of God. We don't want to let a life group go by that we're not, you know, sometimes I understand uh, some of you guys, you guys do a potluck, right? Once a month, right? And that's, that's all fellowship? Yeah. And so if you have it, your life group set up to do that where you're going to have one time a month that's just fellowship, I understand that. But, but, you know, to the degree that you get together to study or to get together to, you know, we should be spending time in, in God's Word, whether that's the sermon for that day or um, some study that you're, you're going through. And oh, by the way, uh, another plug, there's an appendix in here that I'm not going to share that's how to use a prepackaged study in your life group or in your small group, like how to choose them and how to use them. Um, I'm not going to highlight that one, but anyway. We lead people to the Word. We lead people in prayer, okay? And we encourage and equip people, and then we persevere with people, meaning we, we patiently uh, walk with them through the different uh, struggles and trials of life. Uh, any thoughts on this? Any, anything from the study that jumped out at you that was helpful? Oh, man, you guys. So... So let's ask this question. Uh, in, in what, what are the different ways that you have found useful to lead people into the Word? Let's talk, let's talk practical things. Like when you sit down to open up God's Word in your life group, what are the different ways that you guys do that? We just open it and do verse by verse. So are, is somebody prepared to do that, or do you just read a verse uh, and then discuss it? Mark facilitates, but we read the entire chapter 
Okay. We just pick a book and we do it. Took us three years to do Romans. That's about right. We read the full chapter of Round Robin and we start back on verse one and two and we all discuss verse by verse and you know and some people have commentaries in their Bible. We always have a concordance out and we're you know all over the place. So. Great. So we just go to scripture and discuss them. Huh, okay. One chapter at a time. So you do one chapter a night. Well, we try to. We try to. No, we Sometimes try. it'll be ten verses. And we're in Luke, and it's going to take three weeks to get through. Yeah. Chapter yeah. one. Yeah. One. Right. That's a long chapter. Yeah. 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 But that's always the goal. Okay. Good. Uh, it's funny. Um, there is a four commentary series. Uh, it's called. I'm going to get this wrong. Read, Mark, Learn. I think is the name of the series. And they've only completed four of the books of the Bible. Well, no. Two books of the Bible in two books, and then the other one is Luke Part 1 and Luke Part 2. But it's a really useful commentary. I have John and Romans. And all it was is a, it's a small group of a church that was sitting around doing what you're just doing, but somebody was documenting it all. Yeah. Wow. And then they, they the ran it through the editor editorial process, and, and you know some people looked at it. And then they put it into a commentary, and it's one of the better ones that I have. In fact, uh, D.A. Carson endorses it, and if you know him, He's a highfalutin Bible scholar, you know, and he's like, this is really good. It's, it's simple, lay level, but it's really good. You know, you don't have to learn Greek to, to do it. What else? What else do you guys do? Okay. So you do some cross-reference? Okay, good, good. And do you, when you do that, obviously you guys are all, everybody's involved in the group, right? Because everybody's, you know, if it's Romans chapter one, verse one, everybody has a discussion. And then when that naturally trails off, you move to verse two, is that how it works? Yep. Okay, and then same thing with you guys, you guys are discussing, okay, good. I think, I think one of the important things, I mean, one of the things that a small group can do that a life group can't do is, I mean, let's just be honest, okay? I'm not a fool. In a sermon, you can zone out, right? You can just completely tune out. You can start thinking about, I don't know, OSU football or the Bengals. What's going to happen with the Bengals today? I don't know. But in a life group, in a life group where you're, t- you're all together talking about, maybe you're in a smaller group and you're all talking about a certain verse of the Bible, I don't know how you do it, but it might be like, okay, Stephanie, what do you think? Okay, Greg, what do you think? You know, and, and Sam gets mad when I do that. On the spot. <laughs> That's not nice. Because <laughs> maybe know he's. know how people feel, and they're people that don't want to talk, and he's always. Because I'm that person. <laughs> I was like crawling under, at that age, you know, the little kid ones. So I don't like, do it to the little kids. I do it to the adults, too. Right? So, well, I know how it feels, Benny. So. Got to do it in high school, Sunday school class, and they are. Oh, I know. Right. I know. <laughs> I know. I've been having a. a, a yeah. I've got teenagers whew, trying to have a lengthy conversation. It just stalls out unless I keep the ball rolling. Anybody else? And then I have a follow-up. How do you engage people with God's Word in your group? We kind of do a similar thing to what Bart and Beth do in our group. Our group has done I mean, any kind of number of things over the years. I think it probably tends, if I think about it, tends to be a little bit more topical than it has been like exegetical. But we have all that. We have kids that are a part of our group uh, as well and so one of the things is trying to involve the kids in especially reading the scriptures and in, in engaging that way another thing that we've done to keep other people involved so it's not just me is to have other the men in the group lead at various times and so that is engaging them and challenging them to <coughs> get into the word and to develop some teaching skills and the ability to really dig in and be able to present that to a group or lead the discussion in some way. So I think that that's been valuable to just encourage people to be able to do that too instead of just be a hearer. Yeah, yeah. Good, good. Now, here's a tough one. What have you, what have you done when somebody said something that's clearly unbiblical? Right? Yes, Steve. Steve's the master. I just explain truth in a non-threatening way. Okay, so you don't go, come on, dude. You don't, you don't do that? It happens a lot. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, 
the process of moving people from what was the what was the first one like they don't know anything right you know to moving them to the right it's messy right and how many of us knew you know i was talking to bob do you, do you guys know bob mazzy bob and marty mazzy it's debbie Bess's mom and dad marty's going through cancer she's going to pass soon so i've been trying to minister to bob because bob's an old pastor retired guy and i just feel terrible for him because you know his wife of 60 years is is going home to be with Jesus, he's going to be left alone. But I was talk, we were talking at lunch the other day about the hypostatic union, right? Which is like some seminary, nobody cares, right? It's just Bible nerds, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's not the way it's going to happen in your group, right? Somebody's going to say, well, I think Jesus was, you know, born of Mary and Joseph. And so he's, he's just a normal person like us. And you're like, well, actually, that's not what the Bible says, right? So you just speak truth in a non-threatening way. Anybody else have, what do you do when somebody says this, something that's clearly um, unbiblical? Because you can't let it go, right? You have to learn the following skill or the following phrase. Hang on just a second. What's the Bible say about that? And if somebody else can't answer, then you need to be able to jump in and say, or at least say, if you're unsure, at least say this. I'm not sure about that. I'm going to do a little bit of research, and uh, maybe we'll next time we meet, we'll circle back and and touch that, and then make a note and do it, right? Because you don't want to leave people with the taste of false doctrine in their mouth, right? You don't want to you don't want to have them chewing on that, right? So learn the phrase. Hang on just a second. <laughs> Let's talk about that for just a minute, okay? Follow up personally. Yeah. Very good. Okay, last question I'm going to ask, and then we'll go to number number are a lot a little bit simpler. Uh, this is something that I, I I have been. I'm wondering if I'm wondering what you've been convicted of as you've gone through lesson one and two. Here's what I've been convicted of. I'm just going to confess to you. I need to build a time into my group. Maybe it's during fellowship time, or I, I, maybe I just need to be more intentional. But I. I've gotten, the people, gotten to know the people in my group well enough that I know some of the struggles they're going through. And I, this is just me, this is what the Holy Spirit's doing in my life. I need to almost um, get with them while we're having pie, you know, in the corner and we're talking about whatever. Instead of talking about baseball or the weather or whatever, come, whatever comes up, I'm going to start giving, being more intentional about, hey, I've noticed that you're, you know, your understanding of this particular area of Scripture is, is, is weak, or I, I might not even say it like, that way. I might just say, brother, I, I think, I see that you're, you're always down, and you're not filled with joy, right? And so, why don't you try reading uh, this passage of Scripture, and then let's get together and have lunch or coffee, or, or maybe when you come back, we'll chat about, you know, maybe at the next Life Group, we'll chat about it. But to be more intentional about uh, connecting with people uh, and giving them something that they need in order to work on to help them move to the right, right? Because, I mean, every village has its type, right? So somebody in your group sometimes is curmudgeonly, right? There's nothing that takes the, the joy out of a room more than somebody who's just always pouring cold water on your discussion, right? Uh, or, or being Mr. Pessimistic or uh, the church is broken guy, like the church is broken and uh, it's, a, it's corrupt and whatever. And... Uh, or, or always injecting um, politics into the situation, right? Uh, that's no fun. So um, I don't know. What do you guys think about that? Is, uh, what, what are some of the things that you've taken away from lesson one and two that you've personally, right? Because God's working on us first, right? What's some things that you've taken away personally, some conviction about the word of God that you're going to take and try to implement into your group? And maybe you haven't even thought about that yet, and you should, Right? Don't just read this stuff. Let's try to let's try to think about your. I want you to focus on your group in your mind and think, what can I? How can I get the word of God more deeply into somebody's life? Maybe you have somebody who's brand new to the faith, and you need to say, hey, go read the Sermon on the Mount three times this week, and then let's talk about it, you know, over coffee or whatever. Or I'll call you. I'm going to call you on Saturday and make sure that you did it. You know. Ask me any questions that you have about it. Yeah, Rob. Yeah. So I'm thinking that uh, you almost have to. 
can think of, obviously, the individual needs. Exactly, exactly. And think ahead of time what could help them. Because in a group setting, you're, you're thinking, how can I move the group to the right? You're not, I mean, it'd be nice if you individuals would, but to get a little bit more personal, like you're talking about, you really have to be intentional about doing your, your thoughts and your research ahead of time. Well, either ahead of time or um, perhaps take a few minutes of quiet time when the group is over, when you're just, you know, when everybody's gone home and the, and the paper cups are thrown in the trash, right? And make a few notes like, Sally probably needs to hear about this, and, and then you can follow up with them, you know what I mean? Or get ready for that for next time, you know what I mean? Um, but, I, you know, in my group, I have a guy who's stagnant in his faith. He needs somebody to come along and just, come on, dude, what are you doing? You know, just in a loving way. I'm not going to kick him in the butt physically. Um, because I can see in his wife's eyes, right, that she's frustrated that her husband's not growing and leading, right? He's not, he's not out there spiritually blazing the trail for this family. And so um, uh, that gives me ideas on how I can, I can challenge him, right? And if he gets belligerent with me, well, that's a whole new set of problems for you, right? Like that, that opens up new vistas of heart work, you know, that the Holy Spirit can do. You see what I'm saying? Um, uh, we've got folks in our group that are suffering with uh, health things, and they, you can kind of see that the hope is fading a little bit, and so they need to be encouraged, right? They need to be uplifted, and, and um, maybe they need a, a couple of phone calls a week or whatever. You get the idea. Yes, Marv. What you're talking about there sounds to me like it in all likelihood is going to involve time in addition to the life group meeting mm. itself, which that's no problem. I guess my my question is and in the life group that, that I lead typically we have Sunday morning sermon. That's our time in the Word. But the predominant block of time in our group is as people are sharing life situations that they're facing, we attempt to address those with some biblical insight. Hmm. Uh, what are some possible applications and then in following weeks, next meeting or whatever, we try to, how are you doing? Okay. So, uh, I don't know if I'm... No, I, I, I'm, I have a question. I'm struggling then with, this sounds like it's predominantly Bible study. That would not be, and I think if we talk to anybody in our group, they would say that's not what is the predominant element in our, it is more, we use the phrase doing life together, which means we share one another's burdens, prayer requests, encourage one another in that way. So, I don't, I, I don't know if there's a question there or not. Well, no, uh, it, it, everybody in this room has the freedom to kind of do whatever format you want, whether you want to review the sermon, Right, or you want to do? Uh, you guys are doing one, trying to do a chapter per meeting, um, and it sounds like your group, you go through the sermon, right, or we recap it or whatever. But then what you're telling me, which I'm actually going to write down and try in my group a few times, which is like, what are you struggling with, and what does the Bible say about that, and what what are you going to do about it? Is that kind of a thing? That's what I'm talking about, right? That's helping someone move to the right. And then circling back with them in a future meeting and saying, how are you doing at that? How can we pray for you? That's excellent. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's because I, I'm sure if you talk to anybody in our group and ask them, is your life group a Bible study? They're going to say no. Yeah. Ours isn't either. We recap the sermon. But I like what you just said. I'm going to steal it. <laughs> but with that, we have to remember, we said with life groups, we want three core components. We want a component of Bible instruction. Which, which they're recapping the sermon. We yep. want a component of fellowship and we want a component of prayer. Right. So however we want to do that, it's up to us. Yeah. But those are the three 
three components we want to have. Right, and true fellowship, I would argue, is what you guys are doing. It's not talking about Buckeyes, right? It's, it's, uh, it's how are you doing, what are you struggling with, whatever. And, um, and then, yeah, I, I have multiple conversations like that every week. I, got a, I was on a phone call late last night with somebody who's like, this is the situation, what should I do, Pastor? You know, and I walked them through it and they're like, oh yeah, and I, I'm telling them scripture and stuff. And they're like, that makes total sense, I'm gonna try that. So now it's my job to follow up and how'd that go, right? Yeah, Mark. Maybe that's of it. that's amazing. I'm going to write that down. Some of it is how much time within the block of time. That oh, you sure. Have, how are you allocating? Right. right. If you're using 90% of your time in sermon discussion or Bible study or whatever and, and very little for building relationships or finding out about what's going on in people's lives or for the prayer requests or whatever, then you might be, you might be out of balance. Right? Yeah. You might be leaning too heavily in one area. Sure. Yeah, I don't know. How, again, I don't know how you do your group. Our group, because um, different folks have kids and stuff, uh, our entry point is food. So from the moment that it's 5 o'clock to 5.30, people kind of know we're going to be snacking and, and chatting. And then we have an hour and a half of instruction and prayer and sharing. Uh, Two hours to Yeah, 5 to 7. Uh, is what we've been doing so but how you do that you know if steve and tracy want to do a six hour marathon you don't want to do that do you? no what do you guys typically what did you say six hour marathon life group you know no we don't do that okay but that's 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 wonderful <laughs> How often you meet with your folks in your group individually, that's kind of up to you, right? I mean, if, if you're doing Marv's way where you're each sharing what's going on in your life, what are you struggling with, you're talking through it biblically, you can probably then come back. Unless there's a really sensitive issue and you feel, you know, hopefully within your group, let's say uh, Joe goes to your group and Sally shared that she's really struggling with something and, and you talk through it and, and this is what I'm going to do. Maybe Joe will give Sally a call and say, how'd that go? I'm praying for you or a text or something, you know. So I don't, I don't know that it's necessary. It depends on what you want to do, right? I don't know if it's necessary. For you, it's not necessary for you to meet with your group individually, right? Uh, I like to do that uh, once in a while, but I don't do it. I don't do it very often. Yeah. All right. Uh, we're gonna, we're gonna, uh, we're gonna land this plane here for tonight. But uh, I, I wanted to highlight a couple of things. So. Uh, lead the people in prayer, and if I could just encourage you in one thing, don't make your prayer time. <laughs> the, uh, I've had to really work on this in my life group. Don't make your prayer time about pray for a travel and pray for sickness ex- exclusively. What 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 are some things we ought to be praying for in our group? Yeah. Growth, yeah. right? Yeah. Spiritual <laughs> growth, right? Uh, so that's why I'm so in love with uh, the way Marv's doing his life group is because when you get done sharing, like, this is the situation of my life, you discuss it biblically, then that's something to pray about right there in the group. Uh, you know, be with somebody, they need to have a difficult conversation with their daughter, you know, whatever, um, and, and, and you get the idea. Um, so, so just be really careful about that. I'm going to highlight uh, one of the appendices that I, f- I think is really excellent about prayer in the uh, green book. Um, Encourage and equip people. We've already kind of talked about that in the context of the Word of God, right? Um, And, you know, uh, uh, I think one of the things I love about our church is uh, we do do tend to practice hands and feet ministry pretty well. Meals and like the McKees are in my life group and they're moving this weekend. So I love getting sweaty, you know. Uh, just come over, you'll find out. Uh, just don't stay too close to me because I stink. But, um, uh, you know, part of, part of just being encouragement to them is, hey, we've, we're going through a major life thing. We're moving to a new house and, and whatever, so I'm just going to go help them out. So that'll be fun. 
but um, encourage and equip people using the Word of God. And then patience with people. Does anybody have any stories about somebody in your life group that's like really kind of, it's taken them a long time to begin to practice some something in the Word of God and you've just had to kind of keep encouraging them kind of over and over? Anybody have a, a story about that? My, uh, my cousin in Dallas is a pastor at a big church in Dallas. Not a huge church, but um, when, uh, when he had just become a senior pastor years ago, uh, he came back and visited us uh, in Indiana. And he said, and at the time I was helping out with the youth group. I wasn't in the ministry yet. I was just helping out with the youth group. And he said, Scott, you know what the difference between youth ministry and adult ministry is? And I said, no, what is it? And he said, if you teach a student the Word of God and they're in sin, they'll repent. if they repent, they'll change their life tomorrow. If an adult, if you teach the Word of God to an adult and they're in sin and they repent, three years of therapy, <laughs> three years of counseling, and maybe they'll change, right? So, so you got to be patient with people, right? Any stories? All right, let me, I'll move on then. Okay, so... Again, the last thing that I found very compelling in lesson two was, was this. Don't do it. Uh, don't just do it all yourself. Draw others to go with you. And I think what that looks like in, in, in a life group is don't prepare all the food yourself. Encourage other people to prepare. Don't do all the praying yourself. Uh, you know, give other people in the group an opportunity to pray. Don't do all the talking yourself. Give other people a chance, you know, facilitate the conversation, but give other people a chance to share. And when you see someone who's doing well or um, they're making positive changes, you know, um, encourage them and maybe even encourage them to take a more prominent role in your life group. Because here's the here's the um, here's the situation, folks. I mean, um, I, think about your life group. I hate to use a baseball analogy, but think about your life group as a farm team for life group, future life group leaders, right? That someday maybe in your, somebody in your life group who's really growing and changing and moving to the right might be then equipped to step up and them, the next step for growth for them will be to, to lead a life group. And so you need to identify that and, and tease that out and encourage that. And you do that with, you do that just like my former pastor did it to me. He, he, he just looked me in the eyeball privately and said, you may have, you may have some, something that God is doing in your life. You may have something that will be of benefit to other believers, and you, we need to cultivate that, right? I'm like, duh, what do you mean? <laughs> and he's like, well, and, you know, he'll start, he starts throwing me to read and, and, and things. And of course, I'm devouring them because I'm curious about it and everything. And, and uh, he's encouraging me to make changes in my life. And of course, I'm doing it because I'm curious. And that's where we want to be, right? Not that I'm nowhere. No one in this room should walk out of here thinking that I've arrived yet because none of us have. Except for Matt, who was fully sanctified the moment that he came to Christ. <laughs> I think Marvin Maryland might say differently. I don't know. Okay, if you got your green book, um, that's the last slide I have. If you got your green book, take your green book and turn to page. It's in the appendix four, 51, page 51. I'm just going to highlight two of these appendices tonight in the few minutes that we have left. Uh, appendix number four, help your home group in our case, life group, grow closer together. I thought this was a really good article. Um, so, you know, that's all these are at the end. It's just some articles. So it's just got some practical tips there. Spend time having fun together. Get your hands dirty together. Share the gospel together. Grow your church together. Um, you, know, you know, going back to the list that I had up here previously about prayer, you know, uh, I would, it wouldn't be a bad thing at all for you to challenge everybody in your group this is just a practical thing, right? To challenge everybody in your group to take three people that they have in their sphere of influence that they are pretty sure do not know Christ as their Savior <coughs> and, tell, and, and, and challenge that person or those people to start praying for those people daily or routinely. Pray for those three people. And when God gives you an opportunity to share, share. And um, 
at first that may look like just bringing up God's name. And then later on it's, you know, uh, telling them uh, maybe, um, uh, you know, giving them parts of the gospel and you can reach the point where you can share the whole gospel with them. Okay. And then Appendix 5. Appendix 5, I also wanted to highlight tonight uh, on page 53. And uh, this is uh, an article that's written by, uh, about Ezra chapter 7, verse 10. Now, Ezra had determined in his heart to study the law of the Lord, to obey it, and to teach its statutes and ordinances in Israel. And isn't that just an encapsulation of what we're talking about here tonight, right? To, that we, as, as small group leaders, as life group leaders, should be determined uh, to study the law of the Lord, to ourselves first obey it, and then to turn around and teach its statutes and ordinances, not in Israel necessarily, but in, in the church, right? And so this article goes on to, to, uh, to discuss that. So I just wanted to, again, that uh, I would read those. Um, he gives, an, uh, he gives a, um, a quote from Cranmer, Blessed Lord, who has cast all holy scriptures to be written for our learning, grant that we may in such wise hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them. And then on the next page, uh, the writer says, perhaps Cranmer's prayer might be helpfully be changed to hear, read, mark, learn, inwardly digest, and then share the scriptures. Um, so, and then later on, you can see the bullet points down there. I thought those were really good. So I want to suggest that there should be three key questions at the end of every group Bible study. And this, this, these are really good. What have we learned? How should we pray and change in response to what we've learned? Who can we prayerfully share what we've learned with and how? Boy, that's, that gets right to the nub of, um, you know, being an active Christian. Again, I'll leave you with this analogy, and, and then I'll, I'll wrap it up by asking it for any questions. If you take a sponge and you pour milk into that sponge and you set it on this table, what's it going to do? What's that? Stink after not too, not too long because it's milk, right? It's going to leak out, yeah, but it's going to stink. It's going to sit, soak, and sour, right? And um, our, our job is, you know, is like the sponge that's going into the bucket and getting the milk and then wringing it out into another bucket, right? And, then, and in doing that, we will stay fresh. We won't, we won't sour. And, and for me, I'm just going to tell you, I don't know what this, how this manifests in your life. I hate to use that word, but I don't know how it, it shows in your life. Here's, what it, here's how it shows in Scott Teedy's life. When Scott Teedy is sitting and soaking and souring, critical spirit critical spirit. All I do is chastise in my heart every other ministry that's doing it wrong, every other preacher that's preaching it wrong. And when I, get, when I start to develop a critical spirit, I know I'm not spending enough time ministering to others. I'm not spending enough time pouring into others. I'm too busy being right. You know, and it's, it's, it's not a good place to be for me. I don't know what it looks like for you. That's what it looks like for me, critical spirit. All right. Any last minute comments? We're done five minutes early. No, well, four minutes. I'm not going to lie. Okay. Your assignment for next time, Albany and, and Levi, I'll get you the book. Um, your assignment for next time is lesson two, uh, three and four. Three and four. And what's the date on the next one that was in your... Two weeks from now. Two weeks from now. That's right. Uh, your, your, your assignment is lesson three and four. And then the last one's going to be real easy. It's just one lesson, right? Just one lesson. Last minute thoughts. Okay, so here's your assignment. Between now and the next time we meet, and as you go through this, send me email, shoot me a text, whatever. Uh, has this been helpful to you or not? What? Uh, let me know. Uh, I would love to hear. Like, this is what I. This is the equipping I need as a life group leader. This is what I really need, because I, I don't want to waste anybody's time. And if you if you're like, I could really use this, this, and this, I'll get on it. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll get on it. Father, we thank you for this night, and we thank you for the time that you've given us to get together and uh, just think about these things. Father, um, we want to be able to do life together, but we don't want to do life together just to have cake and talk about sports. We want to we do life together in such a way that we're allowing your word to penetrate our heart 
um, whether that be through a sermon discussion, a Bible study, or just fellowshipping about what's going on in our lives and to discuss those things biblically and map out a plan for each other and then hold each other accountable to execute that plan according to your word. We want to allow your word to do its surgery on our hearts and, and move us uh, to the image of your son, Jesus Christ. So we pray that you would do that. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for coming. I appreciate it.